Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our lectionary podcasts. We now come to proper 17. That is Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. This section comes right before the transfiguration and right after Peter confesses Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's during this time that our, um, our Lord then explains to um, his disciples the nature of his ministry, which will end in suffering and death, and then ties that to the form of the Christian life, which is cruciform, which is taking up our cross, even as he took up his for our salvation. So as we look at this story from then, and this is, uh, our Lord knows now at this time that he's going to need to be explicit. Now, this is not simply a time to talk in, in parables or in hidden, hidden meanings. He needs to be very explicit with his apostles, um, lest they uh, think that uh, he is simply the Lord of glory who will usher in a kingdom of glory apart from suffering. He needs to let them know what he is all about and what he is going to do, how he is going to win for them this salvation. So he began, um, and this is openly, to show his disciples that it was necessary. Now this is a big word. It was necessary for him to go into Jerusalem uh, and then to suffer uh, from the presbyters and the chief priests and the scribes and to then be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, in what way was it necessary uh, for our Lord to do this? In one sense, we could say it was necessary to fulfill the scriptures. So in order to fill, fulfill the law and the prophets who spoke about this, we could say it's necessary to fulfill then God's word uh, but even there's something deeper going on in God's will, though, because it's necessary, not because our sin needed to be atoned for, our sin, for our sin there needed to be a payment. And this gets to the question of the atonement. And, you know, there are many, quote-unquote, theories of the atonement, ways of thinking about it. Um, Christus victor, Christ is the victor over sin and death. Christ exemplar, he is the example which inspires us to love. Uh, there's truth in both of these as in other quote-unquote theories of the atonement. But one thing cannot be denied is that if Christ had not been put to death, then our sin would not have been paid for. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without his death, we could not have risen to live with him forever. Um, our sin in the Gospel of Matthew is a debt. Um, in, in Matthew's Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. It means something we owe, things we ought to have done. It's like money. It can't just be taken off the books. It has to be paid for. It's necessary. There's no other way around it. There's no way that he can... And our Lord, he even asks this when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane in Mount of Olives. He says, Oh, if possible, take this cup away from me. In one sense, he knows, though, it cannot be taken away. He must drink the cup of wrath. He must make the payments. It is necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many, many things. I mean, this is it's not going to be easy. It's going to, it's going to end with the crucifixion, which itself is an agonizing death, uh, but will be the beatings and the mocking and all of that along with the abandonment by his father himself. The eternal love of God is God must allow his son to, to die, to take the blame for our sins, that our Lord himself would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows his father's love ultimately will come in the resurrection, but for our time our Lord, the father, must turn his face from his son in order that the son might pay for our salvation, so he must suffer Many things here as far as the persecution, the, the pain of the crucifixion, terrible, um, to be put to death. And then, of course, on the third day, the day of the, the resurrection, on the third day then to be raised. Well, that's the message. Peter, the great apostle then, um, you got to say it's, it's pretty, it's almost comical. I mean, 
we can see ourselves doing this in some way. The Peter, the rock, the one who, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I uh, took him aside, you know, Lord, I love that. He just took him aside, Lord, man, we need to think about this. And um, he began to rebuke him. This is not really your message, Lord. You really don't want to say this. This is not going to inspire people. We Really, you are the Lord of glory. You are the Lord of power. Uh, we shouldn't be talking about this kind of suffering. This is not, I think, a way to start a, a movement. Um, so, um, eleoso, have mercy, Lord. Mercy, it's almost like mercy me. Um, uh, Lord, think about this. Um, be, be merciful. This is not a way to think about it. Let this not be uh, for you, Lord. Uh, this sort of thing should be far from you, Lord. Uh, well, let the rest of us take the blame. Um, you know, when you think about this, um, you think about administrations, or presidents, or you think about uh, leaders. Leaders always have a fall guy so that um, if they're going to, uh, they, they don't want to have accountability so that if something goes wrong, well, who's going to take the blame? It's going to be a lower level person. The lower level person can uh, uh, be fired. The lower level person might even go to jail, or, but never the guy on top. That's for the little guy. And, you know, Peter in that sense, hey, this is not for you, Lord. Uh, the Lord, though, is a different kind of the Lord. He, he actually is the fall guy. Our Lord takes the fall upon himself, and he's not going to listen to <coughs> Peter, who in some sense is dedicated, and in another sense is way, way off. So, he <coughs> so turning, he said to Peter, oh boy, this is rough. Get behind me, Satan. He sees that Satan is at work in Peter's words. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, we see Satan entering Jude, Judas, and we maybe that shouldn't be so uh, remarkable, I suppose, because Judas is the one who betrays our Lord. He's the one our Lord says, it'd be better if he had not been born. So, but Peter is the leader of the church, and he will become a great confessor, a great hero of the church. But at this point, he still wants Christ without the cross. He wants all the glory without the suffering. So he knows Satan is at work here. Uh, th this is the, t the same Satan who tempted him in the, in the desert, saying, you know, receive the kingdoms of this world right now. And uh, he tempted him towards power and towards glory. This is what Satan is doing now through Peter's chief apostle. Uh, and he says, you are a scandal to me. You are a stumbling block to me. Now, this is true, um, and I think this is important also for us in our daily lives as Christians because oftentimes our worst enemies, well, you could say the worst enemy that I have is myself, my sinful self. Satan is my enemy. But also our friends can be our enemy. Um, you know, you, th you think about the kind of friends that you have. Is, are they the friends that encourage you in the Christian life? Are they the kind of friends, or are they the friends who... Uh, look at your decision and they encourage you no matter what, even if it's wrong, even if it's sinful, uh, even if they know it's not right, they say, well, you follow your heart, you do what's right. Well, these are not good friends to have. What we want are friends who love us and are willing to tell us the truth. Um, Peter now is, you know, Jesus does call the disciples fr his friends and he means it and he loves them, but Peter is not being a good disciple to him. Of course, he's he doesn't understand. He's also not being a good friend. He's being a stumbling block. And why is that? Because you don't have in mind, you're not thinking about the things of God, but the things of man. And what are the things of man? The things of man are power and glory. Uh, this is the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What do we want? Um, we want to make a name for ourselves. We want the glory to, for ourselves. We want the kingdom for ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy name be hallowed. It's about the things of God that we pray for in the Lord's Prayer, not the things of man and for ourselves. And that's simply selfishness. Uh, in our heart, we want what we want. Uh, but our Lord says, No. A true love is actually the life of fulfillment. It's never... Uh, to look in a mirror. It's always to look at your neighbor and to love your neighbor. That is the way we think about the things of 
the things of God and not of, not of man. So now Jesus then, he turns to his disciples, and uh, this is a, I guess we're going to say it's a teachable moment. He says to his disciples, if somebody wishes after me to come, come, come after me, so to, to follow in my footsteps, this won't be simply the road to glory, let him deny himself. This is not self-fulfillment. The world teaches self-fulfillment. Do what you want. Do what makes you happy. But let him deny himself and let him then take up his cross. Now, our Lord takes up the one cross. There is no substitute for that cross. That one cross is redemptive. That one cross brings salvation. That one cross is the payment for all of our sins. And yet the Christian life is cruciform. The Christian life is one of daily bearing our cross. Let him take up his cross and then follow me. This is what the Christian life looks like. Our, our Christ, Christ goes to the cross, so also we take up the cross, whatever the Lord might give to us, and we follow him because you know, we've got to put this whole thing into perspective. And the thing into perspective is um, you can't serve God and this, this world. Um, if you receive the praise of, of man, you won't receive the praise of, of God. There's, there is a choice or paths to follow. And if somebody wishes, therefore, to save his uh, suke, his soul, his life, if you want to save your life, or your, then you'll end up destroying it. Um, so you might have your best life now, but then um, that will be a short-lived life. Whoever uh, loses or destroys his life, whoever loses his life. Now this is it for, now um, we're all going to die, but whoever loses his life, henna can emu for the sake of me. Whoever loses his life for the sake of Christ, well then he will indeed find it. So um, to lose your life for Christ is in fact uh, to live forever. To die in Christ is to then be raised with Christ. The ultimate victory comes only those, to, who, those who follow the path of the cross. Those who seek their own glory, apart from God, apart from Christ, ultimately meet their demise. And this puts things into perspective that um, eventually, I suppose, we could say we all get our reward, depending on what you want. Do you want the glory now? There'll be a price to pay later. You'll make a deal, Faustian deal, with the devil. You have this life now, this world now, um, which of course will never be what the devil promises, uh, but you'll pay your soul for it. Um, but in following Christ, you'll take up that cross, and there will be joy in that actually. That's what the devil doesn't tell you that. There's actually joy even in the taking up, or especially in the taking up the cross, following the way of Christ, and he will find it. Um, he finds his life. And then the question, you know, what is it going to, what, what does it profit a man? What does a man profit if, what? He gains, if he, if he uh, uh, gains the whole world, uh, but he, he trades his soul for it. So, um, what will, if he gains the whole world, and, but he trades his, um, like, uh, he trades his soul for it. Um, uh, what will the world mean? It's, the world knows this even. This is an amazing, uh, you can't take it with you. We could go through the uh, list of the 20th century, I guess, uh, the most powerful men. And um, they had power for a while. And then, of course, um, to live once and then to die once. And then to, and then to judgment we go. Life is given to us for a while. We are stewards of this life. Um, uh, but this life is temporary and the life to come is eternal. And that's what our Lord is saying here. What is it going to profit you? Um, if you gain the whole world, but you do so in exchange uh, for your soul, which is in fact eternal. And um, the, the same sort of thought then is, is reiterated, what shall a man give, what, shall a, what, what will a man give as an exchange for his soul? There's nothing, um, it's a bad deal to sell the soul even if it were for the sake of the whole world. And of course people will sell their souls even for for the smallest of things, and it's really, it's really a tragedy when that does happen. So we think about the eternal perspective here, and the, um, 
there are things that matter more. And I think, you know, when we're teaching our children, it's so important because we teach them so much about career, about finding happiness, about getting a good job, um, oftentimes about being wealthy or about uh, developing habits, earthly habits that will also produce physical health. All those things are fine, uh, but when we need to keep it in perspective and say, what's the eternal goal here? What's the long view? And Christians know the people of this world, they might be shrewd in coming uh, in obtaining the things of this world, but the Christian view is longer because we see death not as the end, but as simply the portal to the eternity. And after death comes judgment, either to judgment unto death and to hell, as Matthew talks about quite a bit, but also judgment unto life and life eternal, which is in Christ. So to put things in perspective and think about things. And then he talks about himself. This is, I mean, this is the path to follow. For the, for the Son of Man, he's talking about he is the one who uh, became man for us um, in a state of humility. Now he comes, though. Uh, the Son of Man comes. Uh, so when the Son of Man does come in the, the glory of his Father uh, with, with his angels, and that day is, is coming ever more quickly, our Lord will come. Uh, it's worth telling our people. We might not say the end is near in the sense that uh, the Lord is coming today, but he might. He might come today. He might come tomorrow, but it's coming closer and closer every day, and we must be prepared, our Lord tells us. Um, and, of course, we never know the hour of our own death. So, and he will, when he comes, he will give to each according to his works. There will be a judgment on that final day. And to the uh, trees that bear no fruit, they are th the branches, they are cut down and the branches are thrown into the fire. The tree that bears fruit is the tree that does good works. Um, we are saved not because of this good works, but these good works or these deeds are the fruit of a living faith. This is, and it's the judgment we see according to where did this fruit came, come from? It came from the life of Christ, that which was lived in and by the Christian because Christ had brought him to faith and brought him to see what life really was all about. And then he says, and this is a little enigmatic, I say, Truly I say there will be some standing here, and this is the difficult part. There will be some of you who are standing who will not taste of death until they see the kingdom, the Son of Man, sorry, coming in his glory. Now it's worth noting that um, in one sense this is the perfect uh, inter or preparation for the transfiguration, which is the Son of Man in his, uh, coming in his kingdom, I guess. Um, but also it's the seeing of Christ upon the cross, and then I suppose the, seeing, the, the being witnesses of the, of the resurrection. So it is. This is a, kind of a wake-up call for Christians. Uh, kind of look at your priorities. Ask what life is all about. Think about the life, this life and the life of co to come, and think about it all in terms of Christ, who is our all in all, who is our life, whose death is our path, and in whose cross is, is our victory. Well, thank you for spending a little time with us today.